Well, good day everybody. This is Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar and now I'm going to go into video two on the hydrolase enzymes and specifically what I'm going to be talking about today are the esterases uh, that uh, uh, catalyze the breaking of the ester bond into an alcohol and a carboxylic acid uh, functional group. Um, and I'm going to talk about classification of esterases and the general mechanism of action. So you basically classify esterases into three different classes. Uh, we call them um, A esterases, B esterases, and C esterases. And basically, uh, the way we do it is um, by how um, it interacts with a certain substance known as paraoxone. Um, paraoxone is a uh, anticholinergic, rather. It's it's a uh, it's a metabolite of a of a of a nerve agent is really what it is, and um, we find that the A esterases are actually biotransformed, or um, A esterases um, use paraoxin as a as a substrate, so paraoxin is metabolized or biotransformed by A esterases, um, whereas the B esterases are actually inhibited. Um, by uh, the organo, organic phosphorus agent um, uh, such as paraoxone and I believe other organic phosphorus uh, agents as well can inhibit the B um, esterases. And then you have um, C esterases which don't in interact with uh, paraoxone at all. Um, they're neither, uh, they neither use it as a substrate uh, nor are they inhibited by it. So there you have it, A, B, and C esterases. Okay, so um, how I kind of talked about this in the last video, and I mentioned something known as the catalytic triad. Okay, I'm not going to try to make all the, the molecular models because I don't have enough um, atoms, but basically what you have in the active site of uh, the esterase, uh, uh, specifically the B esterases is what um, I'm going to be talking about. Um, you, you basically have uh, several amino acid residues. So you have some, uh, several amino acid residues in one area, and then you have generally, um, maybe not always, but you know you have a hydrophobic pocket where the high, you know maybe a benzene ring, for example, the benzene ring part of the molecule that's being biotransformed sits, and then you have the rest of the molecule, and you have the ester functional group that sits in this uh, hydrophilic pocket, if you will, and you basically within that pocket you have three different enzymes. You have, um, if you can imagine, um, I have a serine residue here a histidine residue, and then an aspartate, um, aspartine residue is aspartate, really, uh, because it's charged. So I have these three residues, okay? And what happens? Well, alt ultimately, it's, it's, it's serine, and, and serine has a hydroxyl group on the end of it there. And if you go back to your ester bond, you can see that the ester bond um, has this uh, carbon-oxygen double bond here. So this carbon is oxidized and um, you have a, this is, it's a little polar. Um, the oxygen is, 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 is pulling some electron density away from uh, the, the carbon in this case. So the, the carbon is, um, is a little polarized. It, it's a little more positive here. Uh, because there's less um, charge density here than around the, the oxygen. This part's negative. So um, it, it, that serine residue has a hydroxyl group on the end of it, and if that serine residue could uh, give up the hydroxyl group, I'd have this, this oxygen, um, and this oxygen would be a very... Um, it would want to get a hold of, of, of an electron or electron pair, right? is very electronegative, so that oxygen would be attracted to something that was a bit more positive, if you will, and that just so happens to be the carbon here. Um, so the oxygen could be attracted to the carbon, and it could hold that carbon into place, okay, through um, the electrostatic interaction there, and that would hold this molecule into place and allow it would catalyze um, the hydrolysis, allow um, the hydrolysis of the, the bond 
of this, this bond here. Um, but serine needs to be able to get rid of this um, oxygen here. And uh, I believe the pKa of serine is about 14. So under normal physiological situ circumstances, you know, your pH is 7.4-ish in the human body, um, serine isn't really going to want to give up um, this hydrogen under physiological situations. So what you have is you have these other two residues. You have a histidine, and the histidine has a, um, a ring-like structure with a nitrogen on one side, and that nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons, and that lone pair of electrons, they're able to accept the proton from the serine residue. So the proton, the serine residue goes over to the histidine residue, okay, and that's what allow, takes, that's what allows this hydrogen, this oxygen to be quote unquote open, if you will, interact with the carbon um, on that uh, that ester bond, um, and then that that proton can then go uh, and associate itself with the uh, lone pair of electrons on that that nitrogen within the ring um, on the end of of the histidine residue, and then uh, the histidine residue itself um, is stabilized. Okay, it's stabilized in place. Uh, by an interaction um, over here, the interaction over here um, with um, an aspartate, um, where the aspartate has an oxygen, um, an oxygen going to a carbon and a double bond O, and the oxygen is just hanging out there, it's electronegative, and so it can interact with, uh, so basically on the ring structure, if you imagine I have the ring structure here in the middle of that histidine, I have a um, I have my nitrogen here, which is accepting the proton from the serine, and then I have a nitrogen-hydrogen bond here. Um, that so that hydrogen is attached to a nitrogen, and it is uh, polarized, right? Because nitrogen is electronegative, so the hydrogen can then interact <laughs> with the um, oxygen of the aspartate um, residue. Uh, and basically, it's just a hydrogen bond. So the, you have the um, aspartate residue is holding the histidine residue in place through this hydrogen bonding, and then the nitrogen on the histidine residue can accept the um, hydrogen, the proton, on the serine residue, and when that happens, the serine residue can then hold the, um, the, ester, um, the ester group in place, and you can have um, hydrolysis uh, occur. So that is the basic mechanism for the hydrolysis reaction, and because those three amino acid residues are, um, are used, uh, we call that the catalytic triad. Um, now this catalytic triad mechanism is present in other hydrolase enzymes other than just the esterase. That was just one example. Um, there are biochemical um, experiments that you can do that involve um, the use of other enzymes. Um, and if I remember, there what is the there's a there's a major experiment done um, that it involves um, hydrogen peroxide. And too bad I didn't have notes, or I actually uh, could have actually uh, oh maybe perhaps um, uh, remembered uh, that particular one. Um, but it actually involves, uh, it's pretty common, you um, basically, um, it's an enzyme that helps break down hydrogen peroxide into um, oxygen and uh, uh, oxygen and, and uh, water molecules, I believe, because H2O2. Um, so, yeah. Um, there you go. Uh, I believe that is the, oh, you know what, it just came to me. It's the chymotrypsin uh, mechanism. Um, trypsin, of course, uh, being uh, L-tryptophan um, from an amino acid. So you're talking about uh, a different functional group than the uh, ester, but it's the exact same process, and you have the catalytic triad mechanism occurring. And, I think everybody has done the, the chymotrypsin um, experiments where you have hydrogen peroxide all by itself, and it doesn't do much. And then you add the, um, the enzyme to the chymotrypsin, um, and then you have bubbling, and what do you know? You have dissociation of the, uh, 
hydrogen peroxide into oxygen water. That's the oxygen you see bubbling up. It's the exact same mechanism. It's just that we're now talking about this mechanism in um, the, the setting or in the context of uh, xenobiotic biotransformation. Okay, guys, as always, uh, hopefully you found it helpful. And as always, thanks for hanging in there.